Oh, sorry I'm late, lads. Been hectic today. The uh, the missus asked me to get eight cans of Sprite. I got home and realised I only picked seven up. Anyways, what's going on today then? Today, Detective Freezy, we have a very highly requested case by the people. Hmm. Now, this case is solved, but there is a lot of controversy around the outcome. Okay. A lot of the controversy is actually very recent as well. Today is the case of the Menendez brothers. Eric and Lyle Menendez, the infamous brothers, the savagery of their crime, the murders of both their mother and father seem beyond comprehension. This is the Beverly Hills mansion, where in 1989, Eric and Lyle Menendez shot their parents to death while they were watching TV. Eric Gavin Menendez. Mind you, you're still under oath. And are you ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Eric Menendez told his brother Lyle Menendez that he couldn't stand it any longer. What went through your minds when you heard that verdict? First degree murder? That I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. Okay, let's take a little look at the family. Obviously, yes. we have the two brothers. We've got Lyle, the older brother. We've got Eric, the younger brother. Um, and then their parents. We've got the dad, Jose. Um, he was a Cuban man. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have the mum, uh, also known as Mary. But she actually went by the name Kitty. Um, so throughout this case, you'll often hear the mother being referred to as Kitty instead of her actual name, Mary. Yes. Jose Menendez actually escaped the Cuban Revolution and moved over to the US. So while he was in the US, mm -hmm. he got himself an accounting degree at Queens College. After that, they had their first son, obviously that being Lyle. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, then the mother Kitty was able to completely quit her job. The money was coming in, it was looking good. Um, and they ended up also having Eric a few years later. Um, and they both attended Princeton Day School. This is a pretty prestigious school to go to, and it's certainly not cheap. Shortly after that, the family relocated all the way out to Beverly Hills because of Jose, the father, the dad, uh -huh. um, his job. He was like a top movie exec. Um, and yeah, they relocated out to Beverly Hills, as you do. The movie industry is all based out in LA. Yeah. Um, and that's where things start to get a little bit more interesting. All these wealthy families on the outside, they look so perfect and everything seems amazing. You know, the kids are in top schools, all this stuff, but often behind the scenes, it is very messy and things are never quite as they seem. In keeping with the whole family facade of that, a big American dream, perfect family, you know, wealthy, all that stuff, they actually really wanted their eldest son, Lyle, to go to Princeton University. So mm -hmm. what Jose, the dad did, was actually gave a very generous donation of $50,000 to get his kids into um, that prestigious uni. When Lyle was at Princeton, he ends up getting suspended ended from the uni for plagiarism. Um, and it was, you know, this family was so keen to, you know, keep that perfect image that he actually told Lyle, don't come back from uni to LA because otherwise I'm gonna have to explain to everyone why you're not at Princeton. So you can really see that Jose was- He's was clinging he on. He, he really was. Like yeah. this guy, the outside perception of the family was so important to him that, you know, he, he didn't even want his own son to come home. Meanwhile, Eric, the younger brother, uh, was actually really good at tennis. He was ranked 44th um, in the US uh, for under 18 tennis players. It, it, it's safe to say that these two kids were definitely not like model students. They weren't super smart. It was very much the dad doing what he could to make it appear like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, Lyle actually burgled his own girlfriend's house. Bruh, like, what type of person do you have to be to, you know, first of all, steal, but then second of all, do yep. it from your own your girlfriend? Your own girlfriend. So anyway, he stole the knives from his girlfriend's house. He showed Eric this. Now, Eric, obviously, he wants to be like, oh, look, I can do this too. So he goes and steals items. He puts them back. Eventually, they both get found out. And in fact, I think the overall value of what they stole was over $100,000 or roughly around. So this million. wasn't just like nicking, you know, a few quid off of them. No. We're talking about high Serious value stuff. money, jewelry, stuff like yeah. that. They get found out. The dad, Jose, goes around. He writes a check uh, because obviously, you know, to cover damages, all that. He doesn't want this news to get out because 
ultimately, again, it's one of those things where he's doing everything he can to make this family seem See perfect, yeah. as, as good as he can. Not only that, but Lyle was an, a, a, an adult and just about to go to Princeton mm -hmm. uh, Uni. So obviously, if this had come out or this was, you know, had any sort of record, anything like that, that would seriously damage his reputation, the family's reputation, and then ultimately he probably wasn't gonna be able to go to, to Princeton. Now, because Eric is a minor, the dad, Jose, actually makes Eric take the fall here. So he has oh. to put, he receives the punishment. It's obviously gonna be less because he's underage. Yeah. Uh, Eric then has to go to probation and he starts therapy with a doctor known as Dr. Ozil. Okay. Things always go a little bit deeper. Now, um, Jose himself was known to have a bit of a mistress, a bit of an affair mm -hmm. um, with a woman in New York for quite a few years. Gotcha. Uh, not only that, but also access to prostitutes in LA. He also had another woman in LA. Now, the mother, Kitty, mm -hmm. um, she actually ended up overdosing, uh, having too much Valium, and she was taken to hospital, uh, and the doctors there believed that she had tried to commit suicide. Jose was known to be quite a fit person. In fact, a neighbor told ABC News this story. When we went to the house, there was always a ferret and the ferret died one day. And Kitty and Jose assumed that one of their dogs had killed it. And one of their dogs was a black, very aggressive dog. They had aggressive dogs. The children opened the refrigerator one day and found the dog's head inside. Could you imagine that? Like you, you You've get, gone you in for some milk. Yeah. Bang. There's a your, your dog's head is just chilling in the thing. Like Something is something is wrong with this family. Like that, that's not normal. If, if yeah. your dog misbehaves, you discipline it. You yeah. don't cut its head off. So you can see, this was a wealthy family living in Beverly Hills. Really wanted that clean image, but ultimately, as with a lot of these families, there's some weird stuff happening behind closed doors. Yes. So it's the day of the murder, August twentieth, nineteen eighty nine. We've got Lyle, he's 21 years old. Yep. And his younger brother, Eric, was 18 years old when this happened. So young. Really, seriously young. And this, this story is just nuts, right? Um, what happens is uh, the two parents were sitting on the sofa. The mum, Kitty, was asleep and mm -hmm. Jose, the dad, um, was just sat there. The two boys come in and shoot Jose, the dad, in the head. Yeah. Obviously, that's gonna make some racket. Uh, the mum wakes up and they shoot her as well. Wow. It's important to know also that they actually shot them in the kneecaps as well. Maybe to make it look like, you know, the mafia's done it, you know, organized crime. Yeah. Ultimately, they were going to try and get away with this and, yeah. and, and not, not go down as the killers. So they did their best to make it seem like it wasn't them. Mm -hmm. They initially thought that just the gunshot sounds alone would alarm the neighbors and they would call the police and the police would have come around. Mm -hmm. But after a little while, they realized that the police weren't gonna come around. And based off of that, they decided, right, okay, well, we can go and try and get a bit of an alibi here. So what they did was they, got, they went, uh, put on some clean clothes and they actually went to the cinema to watch Batman. Pretty good movie, I must add. Yeah. But um, yeah, they, they've gone there and then what they did was, Upon their arrival, they then decided to, you know, make it seem like, oh, we've come back. Oh, our parents are dead. Yeah. Call the police. And they just act like super distraught, you know, shocked. Yeah. All this, like, please, someone help. My, my parents have been killed. Yes, police. Uh, What's the problem? Seven 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 now, another neighbor said that she seen one of the Menendez boys just like curled up in a ball on the lawn, like screaming, like crying in pain grief. and grief. Yeah. Um, now, the police didn't even check um, the boys for like gunshot residue on their fingers and stuff. See if right. they fired any firearms recently. And what to about, be honest. What about the murder weapon? Surely like these guys have just shot the dad in the back of the well, head. Well, the murder weapons were actually in the car. Right. Which they didn't check. They didn't even check didn't the check. car. They could have found them there and then. It could have been pretty much done. Um, but there, at this moment, besides that, there was no like clear evidence pointing towards Menendez brothers right. as being, you know, the ones that the, did it. Yeah, suspects at yeah, all. Suspects. And they actually came out. Uh, one of the prosecutors even said that the way they treat like Beverly Hills cases mm -hmm. tends to be very different to how they would treat. Uh, like sort of central LA criminals. Of course. Because obviously people in Beverly Hills are very wealthy. They tend to just lawyer up, they'll file complaints, all this sort of stuff. So I think they have to be a lot more 
maybe strict and by the book. I think that was quite an interesting point to make um, is the fact that you know the Menendez brothers weren't even considered a suspect at all to begin with. They didn't find the murder weapon, which was just in the car, right? And they didn't even check the brothers for gunshot residue. Mm -hmm. Like. You're looking at two wealthy Beverly Hills yeah. kids, you know, good looking kids. They probably looked at them and go, nah, no way. No way. They play yeah. tennis. Just once the parents had died, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, the amount of money that these two boys had received was somewhere in the region of $14 million, which Ooh. is obviously significant. And with that money, they then just went on a spending spree. They were buying Porsches, Rolexes, and even Eric, the tennis player, yeah. ended up spending something like $40,000 on a tennis coach. Could that have been the, uh, one of the motivations for it? it? They put a house deposit down on a tennis coach. That's yeah, that's absolutely crazy. Absolutely outrageous. And even bought adjoining condos in LA and they were traveling to Caribbean, London, all kinds of crazy they were, stuff. They were living it up. Living like, a like, lavish life. Considering both of your parents have just died, I'm not too sure if that's what you should be doing with the money or even, you know, it, 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 put it this way, it is very sus. You know, would you rather grieve without the Rolex or grieve with the Rolex? It is, does it count? I don't know. Does, does, does grieving count you if you're grieve, buying you a Rolex? You grieve in your house or you want to grieve in the Caribbean? Into the picture, Craig. Now, Craig okay. was a friend of Eric's, okay? Now, apparently, according to Craig, Eric confessed to the murder of his parents 12 days after the murder. Right, What? To, so Eric straight up just said, I killed my parents to Craig. Yes, Fair now, enough. you know, Craig's gone to the police with this information. They've made Craig wear a wire, go meet up with Eric again, you know, get him to confess his story whilst, you know, Makes whilst sense. he's got the wire on. So that does happen. Craig does meet Eric again and boom. Eric actually changes his story completely and he doesn't confess to the murders. But that would also sort of ruin a little bit of Craig's credibility because yeah. ultimately the police are believing him saying, okay, I mean, if this did, if this did happen and, and, and now Craig, after he failed to get the confession, comes mm -hmm. back and say, no, honestly, I promise you, he, he, he did tell me, he did tell me, but. Yeah. Makes it, Craig look like a liar. Like yeah. he's, just, he's waffling for a bit of attention, fame, yeah. TV interviews, stuff like that. Well, that was the thing. A lot of people said that that's sort of what he was doing it because he was doing loads of different interviews you know he really didn't mind being in front of the cameras during this whole process mm -hmm. now eric is still seeing his therapist dr ozio and he actually confesses to the murders of his parents and his brother's to the, to the therapist dr ozio now dr ozio doesn't break dr patient confidentiality in fact what he does do is he tells his mistress judalon smith and she goes to the police and tells him everything so he doesn't break the doctor-patient confidentiality yeah. to the police, but he does break it by, by telling yes. the mistress. And I'm sure he's probably thinking, no way she's going to go to the police mm -hmm. or, and, you know, whatever. But she ends up, imagine if he had never told his mistress, this case just would have never gone anywhere ultimately. Yeah. The boys might have completely gotten away with it. And then not only that, but when Lyle found out that Eric had told uh, Dr. Ozil mm -hmm. uh, about, you know, well, confessing to it, he, he, he was absolutely fuming about it. Uh, as you can imagine, because like you said, they were going to get away with this. Now, their sort of fate almost rests in Dr. Ozil and whether he's going to tell anyone or even go to the police about it. I'm just surprised that he's told the therapist in the first place. Like, I, yeah. guess, I guess that's just, you know, he's obviously thought he's been going to him for a while. He's helped him with so many problems already. He trusts like him. He trusts him so much, obviously. Or maybe it was just too much on his, con you know, yeah. his conscience. He, he, he just couldn't hack it. Anymore. He needed to tell someone. He had to. After all this happened, Lyle gets arrested on March 8th and Eric gets back from a tennis tournament in Israel, lands in LA and turns himself in on March 11th. Um, they obviously didn't get given bail no. at all. And then they also, as brothers, they were separated as well. Um, and I can imagine that so that they can't come up with a story yeah. or try and do anything like that. They can't make their stories match up together. Yeah. It's going to make it tough. August 1990, mm -hmm. uh, there was a big thing all about the tapes, uh, the tapes of the recordings of those therapy sessions. 
And there was just a, a, a bit of an argument and the defense wanted to appeal the fact that they were considered admissible so that they could use them in court. Um, the defense were pretty much like, hold on a second, let's just see if this is actually fair. Um, because they weren't sure whether it was breaking doctor-patient confidentiality, mm -hmm. but ultimately Lyle will actually threaten Dr. Ozil about the whole thing. And Dr. Ozil felt as if his life was in danger and the, the two boys were actually gonna kill him because of the knowledge that he oh, had, okay. right? In August 1992, the Supreme Court of California ruled that most of these tapes were admissible, including the one where Eric actually discussed the murders. Now this led to the jury to indict the brothers in December 1992. I'm not gonna lie, Chip. Uh, that's some terrible news for the, for the brothers. Ultimately, I think the last thing they were hoping for was the fact that one, the tapes could be used, uh, and two, uh, the tape of him discussing the murders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, ima I can imagine uh, his, his day was ruined with that oh, information. Definitely. And in July 1993, this was the first time the defense claimed that the reason for the killings was self-defense. As if it wasn't just like cold killing. They, they tried to use the, the self-defense. Yeah, defense. now what was the reason for the self-defense? Yeah, self? so they claimed it to be like psychological, physical, and sexual abuse from the father, Jose. This like changes the whole narrative Massively. story now. Yeah. Like, and now the, the boys could potentially be the victims here. Yeah, exactly. Not only that, but there's actually, you know, clips of, um, you know, the brother just sort of talking about his experience, about the abuse, the sexual abuse, and how his dad used to touch him and all this really messed up stuff. He just said that it was our secret, that bad things would happen to me if I told anybody. How old were you? when this stopped? Eight. So, you know, so some say that they've just come up with this to get away with it on a lighter sentence um, on manslaughter. Trial rolls around and they actually hire a defense lawyer who goes by the name Leslie Abramson. And this is a quote from the LA Times on how they described her. A four foot 11, fire eating, nuclear strength, pain in the legal butt. Oh wow, she sounds like some woman. She sounds like a badass. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, that's probably like one of the wildest description of anyone I've ever heard. Um, but yeah, ultimately she was brought in and her, her whole job was essentially to prove uh, and to really fight for the case that these boys had been abused their entire life and it was them doing this in self-defense. Mm -hmm. You know, the dad was doing all sorts of horrible things to him and they did this because they wanted it to stop. Yes, and even during the case, she made the boys wear like colorful sweaters and stuff to yeah. make them seem younger. Instead, you could, you know, these kids have got money. They could have rocked up in their little- Well, they did, you stuff. know, to, to begin with, they rocked up in suits and all this sort of stuff. And she and, had really come in and she wanted wow. to change the perception of it mm -hmm. and make them seem almost younger than they were. That's quite so, smart. Yeah, I mean, look, there's so many of these like little underhand tactics that lawyers- Can and, help, uh, go yeah. a long way. Especially when you're trying to convince a jury as well, mm -hmm. um, because what ended up happening was in that very first trial, the jury was actually hung, meaning it was a, it was a tie, um, and they end up going into a second trial. Some of the things that were actually discussed in the trial. Now, um, Lyle actually had a pet rabbit, right. and you know, one morning he wakes up, goes to his pet rabbit, and he's found that the pet rabbit has had its head bashed in. Now that now that's yeah, what is with this family and just animal abuse. I like, know. For, remember we had the dog. The dog. The, the dog with the head in the refrigerator, and now he comes down and his rabbits had his head bashed in. Yeah, he was traumatized. He actually wet his bed until he was fourteen, probably because of that. Incident. Because of that incident. Yeah. Another thing was that Kitty, the mother, mm -hmm. um, there was another story about her actually blaming the kids as to the reason as to why she didn't make it in her broadcasting career. So Ooh. what she tried to do, or claim, they claimed that she tried to do, was poison the kids. And it, mate, that, like the stuff that came out during this trial is just so bizarre. Wait, so she she tried to she threatened to poison yeah her own kids her own kids. Oh, this family. This family. I mean, you, we have to remember that these are all you know stories that are being told to ultimately help the Menendez brothers' self defense case, right? Because mm -hmm. they were trying to paint a picture of you know abusive parents and a, a very a, a really twisted dad. Um, and then not only that, but a mum who just stood by, let it all happen and knew that it was happening. 
Another thing that was brought up in court, if you remember, we spoke about him earlier, Craig. Oh, big, Eric, good old Craig, good old the Craig. guy that failed to get the confession in the first place. Yes. Anyways, he's back in the mix yes, now, Yes, Eric's friend. Um, now, they didn't actually have this, but they, had a, they wrote a screenplay, Eric and Craig. They didn't have it in court, they just discussed it. And it was about two kids killing their parents. So they'd written out this story, and was it really, uh, did it end up being really similar to it? I th well, I think that's the idea, right? Yeah. If it's discussed, it's obviously maybe pointing in a certain direction, like, hmm, you wrote a screenplay about it, and then you went and actually did it. Yeah. Even though it wasn't Eric and his brother that wrote it, it was Eric and Craig, still. Yeah, it, it's not a great look. No. The second trial actually took place in 1995 with a judge who goes by the name of Stanley Weisberg. Mm -hmm. What he wanted was a lot less cameras. This was obviously a very public trial that was going on at the time. And yeah, he, he essentially kicked out a bunch of the cameras. Uh, not only that, but they, he also didn't allow a lot of the sexual abuse claims in this particular trial for whatever reason. Um, not only that, but he also didn't allow the jury to vote on manslaughter charges. Okay. Um, uh, instead, it had to be uh, vo voted on murder. Oh. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty weird. I mean, I don't really know the reason for that. In 1996, both brothers were convicted of two counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder and were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. So they weren't actually given the death penalty by the no. jury. Um, and that was because that they hadn't had any convictions prior, which actually ties in um, with, do you remember that robbery that we spoke about early doors and how Eric as a minor took the fall for it and he wasn't an adult? If Lyle had actually been the you know, one charged and, and he took the fall originally yeah. for that robbery, could he have potentially had the death penalty because of that thing that happened ages ago? Possibly. That's... Now, both brothers were sent to two completely different uh, prisons, both at maximum mm -hmm. security, um, which also meant that they were isolated from other prisoners. You know, these are two brothers. Then, uh, you know, they were never going to see each other again until April the 4th, 2018. Only a few Ooh, years ago, three years ago for us. Um, and they actually got moved into the same housing unit. So they got moved into the same prison, but then not only that, but now the same housing unit, and they were actually reunited for the first time in like 20 years or something. They're absolutely wow. nuts. There's actually, you know, uh, not video footage, but uh, like uh, an interview that was conducted shortly after that, so those two brothers were reunited and him uh, talking about it, uh, Lyle talking about it. Um, and it, it just, it, it must have been nuts. I mean, you think you're never going to see your brother again, and next thing you know, you're in the same housing unit as him. I ended up bursting into tears, which is quite an emotional moment. Well, I mean, it was unexpectedly so, I think, for me. I, just, I thought maybe I'd just be numb. It was just something I, I wasn't sure was ever going to happen. It was just a remarkable moment. You, there's actually a picture of Lyle mm -hmm. um, that was taken just before he met his brother, and you can see he's proper cheesing. Like this guy is, is, is gassed to to finally be re reunited with his brother. But yeah. Now both brothers actually got married whilst they're in prison. Eric marries his pen pal in 1999, and Lyle also got married to someone who's a former model. Right. But <laughs> this is funny. She divorces him a year later because check this out. He's been writing to other women. No, what, well, I men swear. men are <laughs> trash. How how can he be caught out for cheating on his wife? He, he when he's in prison, bro. I can't believe this. Bro, like, men you, will men will always find a way. The opportunity to get married to someone whilst you're in prison, and you're probably not going to get out. A former model, and you're still writing to other women. But fortunately for him, he did actually get married again after that. Two years later, 2003, he marries a journalist. Fair enough. He, he, let's hope that he stopped writing to other women. Right, let's fast forward a little bit to now. And let me tell you this, I, I'll be honest, I didn't expect to talk about TikTok in such a high profile case yeah. like this. But honestly, you know, things are heating up over on the TikTok world. So as you know, on TikTok, there are constantly new trends and all this stuff. And this really weird trend uh, started happening where people would play like a certain sound and it was all about like, um, attractive prisoners or what criminals. Was it? I'm in love right. with a criminal or something, a prisoner or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it was something like that. And what they would do is they would put like montages of just attractive criminals. Yeah, don't forget about the little transitions, you know, the lights, Mate. the flashes, the little <laughs> parts all over. Man. It's as TikTok as it gets, the right? The zooms. Yeah, the and edits are good, by the way. You're probably thinking, Cal, what has this got to do with the case? Well, uh, this becomes really popular 
um, as one of the brothers is just constantly being used in this trend. Mm -hmm. And what happens from then is it actually raises awareness about the case. Yeah. And what they start doing, they, uh, you know, the, the TikTok detectives uh, really get to work and they start looking into this case. Um, and they start looking about how the case was handled uh, and they started to notice like a lot of things wrong with this case. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, maybe it was the, um, the sexual abuse wasn't really allowed to be brought in in that second uh, trial. Um, there was just a lot of things that raised a lot of eyebrows. So what they ended up doing was there's this serious campaign that's been put together to uh, message in, email in to um, like the district attorney of LA saying, guys, look, there's a lot wrong with this case. We need to reopen it and look at it. Not only that, but there was also a letter yeah. um, that was written to one of the brother's cousins, right? Okay. And in this letter, I believe it was around eight months before the murders happened. This would be massive for the self-defense theory because obviously if he's talking about all this stuff before the yeah. murder and he's writing it in a letter to a cousin, that is absolutely mega. That's pretty good evidence right there. There might be the evidence that could you know, Ch change, change the, the outcome. Case. Yeah. Exactly. So um, they are waiting to sort of uh, authenticate this letter. Uh, and not only that, but decide whether it's worth bringing into. I mean, it's a whole bit of new evidence. Mm -hmm. There was also some talk as well that there might have been some pressure on the LA district attorney to convict because they just lost the OJ Simpson case. Oh wow! Which, so that was course, at the same time, was it? One of the was biggest it? cases of all time. Yeah. He might have felt a little bit like, oh, I have to come here. They with just conviction. lost that case. Yeah. So they needed they needed a dub. Yeah. Right. And, and and they maybe just thought, right, this is the case where we're gonna we're gonna make it yeah. seem like we're doing our jobs properly. We're not we're gonna, gonna lose this one. Yes. We're gonna do it even if they could potentially be wrong. What do you think, Chip? I, I wanna know, like, ultimately we have two, we have two theories here, okay? Let's run it through. We have uh, the theory that they killed the parents for the uh -huh. wealth. You know, there was a lot of money coming in and the way they started spending it and splashing it definitely didn't help their case. No, not at all. Then we have the other side of it, which is that self-defense. And it was all to do about the abuse that the kids suffered at the hands of the dad and the mum just really standing by doing absolutely nothing. Uh, and that they killed their parents in the fear of just this constantly happening to them for the rest of their lives. You know, it's definitely, there's definitely, you know, something going on with the father. And it's in the, you know, we spoke about the dog's head being found in the fridge, it's you know, the, pe the pet rabbit. Even stuff like where Eric claimed that his mother was beaten by their father. Yeah. Stuff like that. So there is obviously something dark going on with him. Now, did he physically abuse them, very possible. Did he sexually abuse yeah, them? Very possible. Also possible, with that evidence you spoke about, that letter coming out recently uh, to the cousin. Yeah. That is the only bit of substantial evidence towards the sexual well, abuse, it's, it's, them, it's, right? It's kind of like the proof that they need to be like, yo, we didn't just make this up. Yep. Uh, for the case to get away to, with to it. get away with yeah. it yeah we, we, we didn't just do that like this is genuine proof that this has been happening mm -hmm. a lot of the family members are on the boys side as well yes. the they're with the brothers on this and you know a lot of people have just spoke about how you know the father was not a very well liked man stuff yeah like he wasn't it, a lot of to it was very toxic like you know that toxic masculinity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they said that the father just just reeked of it like that, yeah. that was it that was him so i mean i don't know i'm really on the fence um, I, look, you it's know, a tough one. That's, it that's really is a tough one. I think there's gonna be mixed, mixed reviews. In we want to know what you guys think. What do you, what do you guys think in the, in the comments down, uh, down below? Obviously, like this is a really tragic and just horrible case. No matter what way you look at it, um, and look, I, I, I hope that that ultimately the the answer is found out. Mm -hmm. But let's see where this new evidence goes. That could goes. change. Yeah. Could yeah. Be, maybe there'll could be, be a part update. two of this yeah. in the future, who knows? Anyways guys, I think for now we will leave it at that. As yes. always, we wanna know your guys thoughts down below. We are always reading the comments, your guys theories. What are you thinking about this case? This is a really high profile case right now. And because of that new evidence and because TikTok have brought it back to life, yeah. Is back on the menu. Yes, and guys, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell. You know, there's a new video every Monday, Mystery Mondays, 6 p.m., and you don't want to miss it because Detective Freezy and PC Crimes have just solved another case. Well, we haven't. Well, we haven't, but we... In our minds. We have solved it, okay? Anyways, we'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Oh, mate, what a day, Big honestly. Day.
Right, Mrs. sent me to shop, get eight cans of Sprite. I only got seven up. Oh, that's not how it goes. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Sorry about that one, Chief. I'm running a little bit late today. Not this a problem. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> Just let me deliver my fucking lime chip. I said not a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's too no, but it is a problem. <laughs> okay, you got it, yeah? Wait, I was only picked seven. All right, cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late, fella. It's a chip. We're gonna be all fucking naked in this shit. People wanna, people wanna go home, bro. I wanna have a beer on the rooftop. I'm, I'm crying. I've been crying for ten minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late, there, chip. You know what it's like. Mrs. asked me to pick up eight cans of Sprite. Got home and realised I only picked seven up. Anyways, put you on the phone. Who you speaking to? Your missus. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, sorry about that one, fella. Missus asked me to get eight cans of Sprite. Mm -hmm. Got home and realised I only picked seven up. <laughs> Why, Chip? <laughs>